disciples and tells them you some things are going to happen you probably not going to understand uh, then he was arrested the deal with the, the, the part with the Peter getting upset cutting the guy's ear off and Jesus heals that they arrest him and take him to Pilate they take him to different courts trying to get him convicted Pilate seven times goes out and he talks and, I, and it was amazing when I found out that it was seven times What's God's perfect number? Number seven. Pilate seven times begged these people, hey, 
I've got this skunk over here. He's a thief. He's a robber. His name's Barabbas. Why don't you let me let him go? Because what did Pilate say about Jesus? He said, I find no fault in this man. Pilate, he said, I washed my hands of it. I don't even find any fault with him. So let him go. And the people said what? Release unto us Barabbas. Hang Jesus. Do whatever you have to because we don't like the guy. Of course, that's Satan. Of course, that had to happen. God had a plan. He knew God didn't have a plan, but he knew what was going to happen. So Jesus is, uh, goes through all the trials. Hadn't had any sleep for maybe 72 hours all this time. You know what that's like. And then he has to carry his cross. He's beaten with a cat of nine tails 39 times. Um, I heard preacher talk about this the other day. And of course, I knew this, but he reiterated the fact that with what they made this cat of nine tails with, the stick with all these leather straps, and they would put shards of metal, they would put shards of glass, they would put shards of rocks, anything sharp, and they would strike the victim with it. Now, most of us, most human beings, if your back was bare, and even if it wasn't, if you got hit with one of those things in the back, it would probably bleed out, You'd, that'd probably be enough to do you in. But Jesus... 39 stripes. The law said if you give a prisoner 40 stripes, you've got to be very careful. If that soldier would have beat Jesus 40 times, he would have had to take the punishment 40 times. So they're very careful, but 39 times, but the Bible says by his stripes we were healed. Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from how much unrighteousness? All. From all unrighteousness. So we come to this picture, he's on the cross. His arms... A nail had been put in each hand, and I mentioned last week, if you weren't here, we always say his hand, but doctors say that if you put something like that in the hand, it would rip out. It was more than likely they, what they always did was put it through the wrist. So you can imagine the pain. You can imagine the pain having a, a nail big enough. I've seen some long nails, gutter nails, you have to go through the whole gutter. Um, I've seen some big spikes. I found a couple of railroad spikes one time and took them to where I worked those like that. I took them and painted them and baked them in the oven. And Ryan and Randy had them for years. I don't know if they still got them. Painted one red, one blue, just to have something you need. Um, but have something like that put in your wrist and your feet. And Jesus is hanging here. We said last week, we don't know how many people were there around the cross. It's up on Calvary, on Golgotha, on that hill. We have no idea how many there. We, we don't have any idea. Not, not, a, not an idea at all. But he looks out at the people. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, most of us as human beings, and you've got to admit it, when somebody does something to us, now, I know there's grace, I know there's mercy, I know there's we're supposed to be forgiving, but as humans, when somebody does something to us, and we're all guilty of it, every one of you have done it, if you say you have it, be the first one up here at the altar in her invitation. We want to strike back. Amen. Am I right? I can, I, I'm going to get even. You know that person did that to me. I don't like it, so I'm going to I'm going to make them suffer a little bit. <clears throat> I'm going to make them suffer a little bit. When I was in college, there was always pranks in the in the dorms, and it wasn't just the guys' dorms. I heard we you know girls. They did a bunch of pranks too. There's always somebody doing pranks in the dorms. One of them was you take somebody's sheets when they go down the laundry room. You wait till the final rinse. Stop the washer. You pour a cup of sugar in it. Rinses it out. They take it. Dry it. And back then, how many of you know what it's like to be with no air conditioning? <laughs> back then, there weren't no air conditioning. Bill wouldn't have had a job. No air conditioning. And you put, they take them and they dry them and they put them on their bed. When you start sweating, guess what that sugar does? It's sticky. You, you never knew what somebody's going to do. There's always pranks. You can paint somebody's door. You can paint their door where they couldn't open it from the inside. You know, there's always things going on you never knew. It was, it was, nobody ever got hurt. Nobody ever just that. There was always pranks going on. Things happen. But we never got in a fight, so there wasn't anything for him to forgive. But Jesus looks down at them and he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So now he's hanging on this cross. There's three crosses. And 
if you start there in verse number 39, as you know, there's three crosses here and, and um, two other people hanging by him and they, they were deserving of their punishment and this was a form of punishment back in that time. But one of the male factors uh, which were hanging there, of course, they railed on him and he said, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Well, instead of asking for mercy, this first guy, hey, if you're this Jesus that I heard about, why don't you just save yourself? Could he have? What's the song we sing? He could have called 10,000 angels. But you know, with the power, by his power being the Son of God, he really wouldn't have had to call 10,000 angels. He could have taken himself off of that cross with no scars instantly and been in heaven. And he would not have had to answer for anything. Well, I guess he would have because that was the plan for him to die. The next word in verse number 40 says, But the other, one railed on him, said, Why don't you come on, you, you skunk, save us. <coughs> the other one answered and rebuked him, saying, Dost that thou fear God? Seeing thou art in the same condemnation as this Jesus? You're about to die and you're standing here uttering out words of cursing. Don't you understand it's God? And we indeed justly it says for we receive the due reward of our deeds. Boy, I should have put that on a slide. But this man hath done what? Nothing amiss. We're, we're, we're getting our reward. We get what we deserve. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy glory. And Jesus said unto him, now this is a wonderful verse, boy. Verily I say unto thee, today, not tomorrow, not later, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Not if you earn it, not if you go to church every Sunday, now you need to do that, that's what God had created the church for. Not if you do any good works. Not if you work your way. Not if you walk on coals. Not if you crawl on glass. Not if you do anything. He said, today. He didn't have to be baptized. He didn't have to join the church. He didn't have to put his tithe in. He didn't have, I mean, he didn't have to do anything. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Before we go on, do you realize... And that you use it today metaphorically for the future, but the moment you got saved, Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now I know it's time, and so we use it metaphorically for the time frame, but he said the same thing to you. So, number one, it is a word of pardon. Now this word spoke to a fully, a man that's fully aware of his sin. Many things we don't know about this thief. We don't know his name. We don't know his age. We don't know his crime. We don't have to. But we see the evidence of God's work in his heart. Now, just like all of you, to be friends with one another, we don't need to know your past. Some people talk about what they did, things they did, things they shouldn't have done. But in order for us to be friends, Christian friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't need to know everything you've done. We don't need to know your past. We don't need to know how bad you were, how good you were, or how good you thought you were. We don't need to know any details about that. As Christians, we don't need to know anything about anybody else in the past, except for up to the time they got saved. <coughs> And then what we need to see and what we need to know and what we do see and what we do know is how Jesus worked on your heart. Because the moment you accepted Him as your Savior, you became a new creature. Because the song says that we had this old robe and it had sin on it. And the new robe is spotless. It's never been worn. And we get to put this new worn robe of forgiveness on us because then from that point on, Jesus looks at us and says, you know what? I find no fault in this person. When a child is born, that baby may be covered, not maybe. I've been there twice. We're going through our classes, our Lamaze classes, the first one. 
one man was in there with his daughter because her husband couldn't be there. He was in there with his daughter. I, he, you know, I wish we were in our mid twenties. So he looked like he was about nine, though. He was, he was probably forty-five, something like that. And they just went out and ate pizza. And they showed this birthing process because they want you to see. They had these videos, at least in Springfield. They'd show you these videos of you know movies and what videos back then it was movie. You know, remember the movies? They're on the reels, you know. Um, and they'd show it because they wanted you to see what you expect. And it's birth is not a prettiest picture. That guy got sick, had to go out in the hall, and he lost his pizza. The nurse told us of another guy when he was in the delivery room with his wife, the baby was being born, he fainted. He hit his head. His wife and child went home in two days, he was in the hospital for three days. <laughs> Things happen. Everything's not pleasant. Everything's not pleasant. Things happen in our lives. But when Jesus comes in, when talking about sin, he comes in and he works in our heart, and he makes us as white as snow. Like I said, like I started saying, when those babies are born, they're not the prettiest things, but when that mom takes that baby, when that doctor lays that baby on in that mother's arms or lays it down, she lays that baby on her chest, the look on her face, the, the, the joy after all this pain and sorrow, the Bible says, there's going to be travail in birth because of sin. Lays that baby there, that mom and dad look at that kid, and that kid is perfect. Am I right? In their eyes, they're perfect. That's how God looks at us. When we are born again, this child's just been born. When we are born again, God looks at us. He says, Father, forgive them. Today not to be with them in paradise. He looks at us, and we have no sin. Now, I know that's hard to imagine. Don't look at your spouse and say, I, I can't be you. But when Jesus looks at us, he says, you know what? Because my blood has covered you, and the sins have been washed away, you're righteous in my eyes. We were talking about, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, and the whole thing about the Sermon on the Mount is talking about the righteousness of the believer. We're righteous in God's eyes. Evidence that God is working on our heart. We are aware of God's knowledge of our heart, our being. And then we have the assurance, not only are we aware of this, and not only do we see the evidence of sin being forgiven, our lives being changed, we're aware of this forgiveness, but we have the assurance that our sins are forgiven. Is that important? The assurance of the believer, is that important? We need to be reminded over and over and over of what we were. And then we need to remind ourselves of what Jesus did on the cross and what we are now. Because we need to be reminded because this life is not perfect. Things happen. We call it backsliding. People do things against God. They sin and then they feel bad. And we should because sin should bother us. If it doesn't bother us, we're blind to it. And that's not good. But... We need to be reminded because the devil will do something and the devil's sitting here on this shoulder and he's saying, ha ha, you're a dirty snake. Look what you did. I've had to slide over the last couple years up there a couple times, but when the devil reminds you about your past, remind him about his future. Is that true? Is that good? Where's the devil going to be? He gets cast into the lake of fire. He's sitting there telling you, you're a dirty snake. You, look what you just did. You told a lie. You did this and you did this. Well, number one, we're supposed to repent. We're supposed to get rid of that, those things and ask God to help us. He will. But the assurance of our salvation, we need to be reminded sometimes of how great it is of how, that we are saved. Sometimes we get thinking, well, because I did this, I'm not saved. But this thing called eternal security, we're in God's hands. We're in his arms. A little child counts on, on their parents, their grandparents, their guardians, whoever it is. They're counting on them taking care of them. They're counting on them watching over them. They have to rely on them. They have to, when they're young, they have to be fed. 
Then they learn how to feed themselves, but then later they get older and they start feeding themselves, but then they have to have just until they learn how to cook on their own. Uh, when I was in the Cub Scouts at seven years old, I started learning. Then when I was baby, we had to do certain things, and I learned how to make macaroni and cheese and, and cake mixes and things like that, and little things. But you had to, you learn it, and you start cooking on your own, but you got to have food, but you got to have... When you raise your kids, did they come up every day and say thank you for washing their clothes, for making their bed, for making them breakfast, for making them lunch, for making them dinner, for cleaning the house, for buying them toys, for all those things? Did, did, did your kids come up every day and say thank you for all that stuff? You might have a child that was perfect and did that. Go back a generation. Did you do that to your parents? Did you thank your dad for going to work every day? My, my dad for several years worked in a a machine shop, no air conditioning, a hot place, stamping out plates and all kinds of metal stuff. It was that he came home and he was exhausted. In the summertime when there's 100 degrees outside, the humidity is 175 percent, you know, he was exhausted. I remember. He'd come in and say, can you guys, he said, I'll give you a nickel if you'll rub my feet. If I didn't have good shoes back then, you know, I, I remember we wore black work shoes, but they probably weren't the best shoes and couldn't afford the best things anyway. Uh, but he'd say, yeah, I'll give you guys a nickel to rub my feet. Um, we didn't know, I didn't understand what he went through. But we're forgiven. Prayer is answered. We ask the Lord to save us. We had the promise of life from the Lord, and I'm talking about eternal life, Not, and, but let's take both sides real quick. When we get saved, we have the promise of life eternal, yeah, I'm going to spend eternity with heaven, in heaven with God. But we also have the have promise of a good life here on earth. Do you have a better life now since you got saved than before? Amen. Do you ever, often, do you ever wonder? I do. Do you ever wonder what you would be or where you'd be if you weren't a Christian? Number one, if you weren't a Christian, you'd probably be home right now or somewhere. Dead, probably. I, I, what did you say, Dale? Dead? Dead. And he's serious. I never because he was in the, he was in the, I started to say delivery room. <laughs> he was in ICU and had this meningitis stuff. They didn't know what it was. And he was literally, literally hours away from leaving this earth. And people prayed. Chris, when she had that surgery that time, they botched that surgery and Sonny came in and said, they told Chris that she may not make it, what, a few more hours, whatever. I don't remember the details on that. And we began praying, and we began telling people to pray. And the Lord came down and touched her body, and she's still here. God answers prayer. Yes. But I've also often wondered if I wouldn't have become a Christian, if the, if the Lord would have said, okay, you know, I was 15 when I got saved. At 16, would he have said, okay, I'm done dealing with you? At 18, I'm done dealing with you? At 20, I'm done dealing with you? I'm going to, I have charge of your life. I don't know that. You don't either, but have you ever wondered what you'd be, where you'd be? So then next, it's a word that is personal. Personal. He said, today thou shalt be where? With me. We all like to be with people. You go visit somebody's house, you visit them, you... When I was in Brooklyn, when I was 12, we went to see my butch's cousins. I, and uncle or cousin or somebody lived there in Brooklyn. We went past Yankee Stadium when I was a kid, and I thought that was a, a big deal. I took a picture of LaGuardia across the, just across the bay from, from City Field where the Mets play. I took a picture of that. And then the field next to where they play the U.S. Open, that's right there. I took a picture of that. Not a big deal. I'm just going to show, show, show Gage. Um, I wouldn't want to go there anyway unless the Mets were playing the Cardinals, so it wouldn't matter anyway. Uh, but but it, but I was there, and things changed, like I said. But it, he said, you're going to be with me. We like to be with people. We like to be with people. Most people do. There's guys that are out in the woods, you know, live 40 miles out and never saw anybody for 20 years, and their beard's this long, and never took a bath, and all that stuff. But we like to be with people. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I'm going to be there to help you. The thief cried out for a personal salvation. When we asked Jesus to come in our hearts, when I did, I've told you this before, but when I did, my youth director dealt there with me, and he said, put your name in there. 
that if Richard shall confess that Richard is a sinner, Richard shall be saved. And if thou shalt confess in thy heart, I believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And on all those vows, I put my name Richard. That makes it personal, doesn't it? Yes. Now, Fran wouldn't have had to put Richard. She wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't want to do that. And Connie wouldn't want to say, well, hi, I'm Fran. But it made personal. It said that if I, Richard confesses, Richard shall believe and Richard shall be cleansed and forgiven. And that moment when I got up from the, as soon as I asked Jesus to come in, he changed me, saved me. Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, keep in mind, up till Jesus died on the cross, up till he was risen, up till this happened, there was a place called paradise. It was a holding place, if you will. It was a holding place. There was a gulf between it and hell, but there was a, it was a holding place. But it was just as if you were in heaven. It was as perfect as it could be. Because those did who Jesus hadn't been completed, salvation hadn't been completed, the, the debt on the cross had not been completed yet, the debt for sin hadn't been completed, so people couldn't enter into heaven yet. But there was a place called paradise. And it was as the best you could be. Lazarus, when he died, he went into paradise. And Jesus came up to him and said, Lazarus, come forth. That soul had to come back in his body. He had to walk out of that grave. Come on, man, I, I'm down here in paradise. He pulled me out. You know, Lazarus had to die again, but then he got to go to heaven. But he had this place, paradise. We are going to be in, with Jesus, and I guarantee it is going to be paradox. Amen. Isn't there a town, isn't it Paradise, California? Isn't that the name of a city in, 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 in California called Paradise? And then you have a city in Michigan called Hell, Michigan. So I guess you can make whichever one you will go to. But paradise, heaven. We get to go with him just like this, Steve. He said, today you're going to be in paradise. So let's wrap this up real quick. Today. Look at this next slide. It proves salvation is all of grace. Dale's favorite verse is Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For the grace you saved through faith. It's not a gift of God. It's, it's a gift of God. Not a works lest any man should boast. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith. Wow. Some people say, well, I, I can't mutter up that faith. God put that measure of faith in all of us. We had a discussion about this on Wednesday night. It proves that salvation is by Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is, there is one God and one mediator between God and man. It says the man, Christ Jesus. It's not Mary, it's not a priest, it's not another person, it's not your pastor, it's not anybody. Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. Amen. There's only one way. Amen. There's only one place you can go, and it's through Jesus Christ. Amen. And then lastly, It proves that salvation comes instantly. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. When you confess, it's instant. When I asked Jesus to come into my heart on December 3rd, 1972, he didn't say, I'll put you on hold. How many ever been put on hold when you call somebody? That elevator music, or it used to be elevator music, now you know, never know what kind of music you're going to get. Oh, of course, you, if you want this, press 1. If you want Spanish, press 32. If you want English, if you want French, if you want to do this, want this department. If you know your party's extension, push that number. If you know this and this and this and this and this. If you didn't know, it doesn't work on everyone, but there's a secret. A lot of them, if you push double zero, take you right to the operator. I've done it many times. It doesn't work on everyone, but if you push double zero, just say you don't go through all that stuff. It takes you right to somebody who answers, if they answer the phone. I called Sam Zerdain and the phone rang, 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 finally hang up and hung up and called again. Uh, with all this shortage of because this coronavirus, we were over there Thursday. Toilet paper, paper towels, everything was out. Sam's has a big wall that there's not one. All the antibacterial stuff's gone, all the soap's gone, everything. So I told Sonny, he said, if you go to Sam's, if you do, if they do have toilet paper or stuff, go ahead and get some so we'll have it stock it up. So she went the next day and they did have some. But I walked back there and there's still a whole bunch of empty. It's still there. I was back there on Friday. Um, but salvation is instant. When I said, Lord, save me, 
Like I said, he didn't put me on hold. He didn't say, I'll get back with you. He didn't say the check's in the mail. He didn't say, I'll send a letter of recommendation. When I stood up from that place, I was saved. Amen. Instantly. Now, we say things are instant as we close. We, we like instant things. We want things fast. There's instant coffee. There's instant everything. You know, you just have to wait a long time for these things. And then along right after the World War II, they came up with TV dinners. You didn't have to come home and fix dinner. You could just pop that thing in the oven. Back then, you had to put it in that microwave. You put that thing in the oven, and in a half hour, 45 minutes, you have dinner. It's tasty dinner. Did you see the one up there a while ago with all the old prices from Kentucky Fried Chicken? Man, I couldn't remember how, how, how cheap those things were. Uh, but instantly, we want things instant. And we think they're fast. We want to order our food. We want them to hand it to us as soon as we give them the money. And we want it to be hot and juicy, right? Am I right? We don't want to wait. Maybe. One menu we had to rest our work that said, remember, good food takes time. Yeah, that's right. It does. Well, I smoke things. I'll smoke them for six, eight hours and put them in the oven for two or three hours. Get it real tender. Francis hates that barbecue. I'm going to get it to uh, We want instant gratification. When I got saved, Jesus said, Bam! You're saved. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He asked Jesus to save him right on the cross. Yep, I'll do it. I'll do it. Let's stand with his bow nice close. We're looking for Jesus. Let's have the piano playing if we can. I'm not going to sing, just have the piano playing. Um, you can play softly and tenderly. Because softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling the sinner, come home. We're looking towards Easter. We're working towards Easter and what it means to us. Salvation is the most important thing you could ever accomplish in your life. We do a lot of good things. We do a lot of major things. But salvation is the most important thing we can ever accomplish in our lives. Because that takes us into eternity. Maybe there's somebody here, well, eyes are, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I don't know every, every heart here. I, I cannot know your heart. It's impossible for me to know. Maybe the Lord's speaking to you today and you want to step out and say, I need to be saved. Come up to the altar and somebody can pray with you and say, I need to be saved. I need a new life in Christ. The thief on the cross said, forgive me. I, I, I need your salvation. And Jesus said, I'll take you to paradise. You'll be in paradise today. The most important thing you can ever do in your life is to be a born-again Christian. Jesus will forgive you for your sins and he will cleanse all your unrighteousness and he will take you to heaven when you die. Christian, we're leading towards Easter. I want you to, a challenge to get a name or two in your mind and pray for that person every day through Easter. I know you, several weeks you say, that's a long time, Pastor. That's a long time. Maybe you know somebody needs to be saved and, you, and I want you to invite them to church for Easter. We could fill this place up, put extra chairs. And there could be people here who need to hear the message of the gospel. It's a challenge. Get a name or two, even if it's one. Pray for this person every day. Pray that they will get saved. And don't don't forget, don't, don't, don't let up. Just be relentless with the Lord. He'll never get tired of it. Father, we want to thank you for your love and your grace. Wow, what a story. We know it's not just a story. We know it's not a fable. It's not a made-up story that your son hung on, on the cross. It's not a made-up story that he said to this thief, you're going to be in paradise today. It's not a made-up story that, that this thief got saved. It's not a made-up story that heaven is real. It's all real. We see your grace, your mercy. We see the evidence of your truth. So bless us, Father. This one has come, Lord. We ask that you'll touch lives. Lord, we want to serve you in a way that only we can. Bless us, Lord.
touches you. We ask you a blessing. Yes, Thank Jesus. So let us come to you. Thank you for touching us. Use her, Lord. You have plans for her. Touch your life, Lord. Thank you for it in Christ's name. Because he just got saved. Amen. Amen. Great to stand up here. That's what it's all about. Amen. People coming to the Lord. One at a time. One at a time. She's had a rough life. We were praying for her for a long time. God forgives everything. He touches our lives. Do you remember when you got saved? What it meant to you. The moment you came and you got saved. And you accepted the Lord. Come on up and give her a congratulatory hug or a handshake. Praise the Lord. <laughs>